my name is Lukasz Wojski. I come from uh, Purple Deer Software Studio. We build software, digital products to be exact. And we, oh, thanks. And we do it from the very early stage. We build wonderful products. Uh, but that's not about my main job. This is more about the experiment that uh, I did lately. Um, and I will try to answer the question in the, in the title of the presentation. Will AI take our jobs, and by our, I mean developers' jobs? And not only. OK, let's try if this works. Woo! Uh, I am not an AI, exp AI expert. Um, I'm not data scientist. I have basic knowledge about what machine learning is. Um, but I like to, like to code, I like to experiment, and I did a little experiment that I would like to tell you more about today. Um, and let's start from the top. Uh, OpenAI GPT-3 is like deep, deep, deep learning model that produce human-like text. So you can put any input in there and it kind of gives you the output as it would be a, a human. And this is uh, like a huge net. This is 175 billion parameters. So it's nothing like the small neural networks I did on my university back then. Uh, and it is a state-of-the-art thing, uh, so the results are quite amazing. And I found it because I kind of browsed the internet and saw screenshots from the platform called uh, the Playground, which is available at beta.openai.com, and I guess everyone can try to play and interact with it. So I did, I, you know, have some fun with that, like, it can be a chatbot, it can talk with you. Here I'm asking about some tips, how to prepare for this talk, because, you know, I haven't doing this since the start of pandemic, so, you know. Uh, and it was very helpful and supporting, so that was nice. It kind of understands the context of the, of the chat, so it's very good. Or you can ask it to, you know, write a song lyrics, for example. As you can see, it has some kind of different idea what this conference is about. But, uh, yeah, that's it. So next, I've kind of decided to, okay, what if I would tell it to write me a program, to write me a Python script? And I did this, like, write me a Python program, and here's, like, a ton of requirements in here. A lot of details, and believe me or not, or you're quick at analyzing the, the, the part at the bottom, it actually put all the requirements together and prepared the code. So I said to myself, it's brilliant. I, I will use it to code, but I don't know how. And, you know, turns out I'm not the only one who got this idea. Because OpenAI created something called Codex. And Codex translates natural language into code. It, uh, it's based on the GPT-3, and it works with most of the programming languages. As you can see, there's no Java in here. I don't know why. Maybe because of my personal preferences. Um, and turns out there's a tool that actually utilizes OpenAI Codex and can be used by basically everyone, which is GitHub Copilot. So when I saw it, it was a closed beta. I've applied for the access, and I said, okay, that's nice. One or two days, I will have access to it. And then I started reading uh, GitHub threads that people are waiting for six months or so to get the access. So all my enthusiasm went very low. But my luck, two days later, GitHub uh, announced that it's now a commercial product. And all I had to do was to you know, put my credit card in, get my two months of free trial. And it's still available like this. So um, I, I started to wondering, what should I do with it? I you know, installed it. It's, in my case, it's Visual Studio Code, so it's an extension. But there are extensions to other IDs as well. Um, and I thought, OK, should I you know, create some project from scratch? Should I work on? Put, put, uh, make it help me with some project that I'm working on, what should I do? So I thought about an experiment. 
to write a game in Pygame. Uh, Pygame is a library, uh, Python library to write games, very simple one. The only problem, or the only two problems that I've had were that I'm not good at Python. I'm just using it from time to time to you know, create CTF exploits or something. But I don't understand this language too well, and I'm not good with syntax and everything. And I barely know Pygame, because I was using it once when I was my university, like 12 years ago, there was assessment to create a game, any program in Python, so I created a game. So if I don't know Python and I don't know Pygame, then someone needs to know this, and this guy is Copilot. So I wanted Copilot to become a captain. And me on the back seat just telling him what to do. Uh, I've plugged my microphone, I've uh, turned, on, uh, turned on my screen recording, uh, sit in my room, and this uh, effect of this is the like two and a half hour long video, uncut, unedited, that I'll share with you later. So you can see how I did this from start to finish. It was Sunday. Uh, I start by writing a comment, because that's how you communicate with, with Copilot. One thing is that it can read code and kind of decide on this, but also on comments that we put in the code. So I wrote my first comment, create a game window with 800 times 600 dimensions, using Pygame for the game named Space Invaders and left it open. This left it open I've added because for the first time it just opened the window and closed it. And one tap. And I've got one, two, three, ten lines of code with just one click of the tab button. I did nothing else than writing this comment above, and it generated this. And I don't know Pygame, so it's great because I don't need to read documentation. Um, and turns out it was correct. I've had my game window. Uh, it got the proper size. It got the name of the game on the top. So. Seems wonderful, right? And that's how, you know, two hours of ups and downs started. Because, you know, it was like emotional ro roller coaster for me. Like, some things were very smooth and some, you know. At start, I was very happy that uh, Copilot understand the context of the code. So if I had, like, class in one file, and started to write the code with Copilot in other file. It understood that there, this class has specific fields or methods, etc. So it was, you know, good start. And then uh, I was kind of confused because Copilot started to make up the code that does not exist. Like, I don't know Pygame. I did not read the documentation. But it seems that he did not do it either. Um, like in this case, when it tried to run the setRect uh, method on the Pygame surface, which is not part of Pygame surface. So that was strange. And it kind of made, made, made me to, to take a look into the documentation and tell him in more detail what to do and how to use Pygame, which was a bummer. But it was not that much time consuming. The bigger problem were that I spent almost an almost an hour to try to refactor the code in one way, like change the the code from you know structural structural code and put it encapsulate it within a class. And I asked it to to change one line to assign some information not to the local variable but rather to the field in the in the object. And I tried this and this and this and this and this and this. And yeah, a lot of this, many more than that. An hour straight trying to figure out what I'm doing wrong. So I was close to, you know, telling myself, okay, this copilot thing is not helpful at all. It's not the tool that, that was advertised to me. Uh, I don't want to use it. Uh, but uh, then, uh, I've decided to kind of bend the rules a little bit and kind of write a little bit of the code myself. Like the simple single lines of code, like one field, uh, one field in a, in, a, in a class or something like this. And it started to work because it kind of can read the context of the code and it was far smarter from that point. 
So my assumptions changed, but after all, I've managed to do this. I was impressed in s at some point because I, uh, I wrote comment like this, to create an enemy sprite. You know how Space Invaders works, like enemies are coming from the top to bottom and you need to shoot them. So I tell them that this is the file with the enemy picture, this is the size I want to use. It should be displayed right there. Only that, and I pressed tap, like always. And it created all of this, including that comment at the bottom to move the enemy in every frame. So it kind of figured out itself that I want to create this kind of game and actually add the line that the enemies should go down line by line, like pixel by pixel. So that was very amazing. And finally, this is the, the, the result. I've created the game and I've actually write like, I don't know, just a few lines of code. So it's still a good result, but I have some you know, takeaways from this. Um, GitHub Copilot is sometimes it's amazing and can you know, do stuff like, like this one with moving enemies, but sometimes it's terrible and it's frustrating and it does not understand what we're trying to do. And you have to figure out how to tell it in a totally different way so it can actually understand what's going on. And it's kind of random, so it also not produces the, you know, the same res results every time. The biggest blocker for me was not knowing Python and Pygame. If I would know this, then I would probably do it a lot faster because I would give different instructions to the, the, the copilot and I would, you know, um, it, it won't be two hours, but maybe an hour. Um, it makes a big difference in terms of productivity. Clicking one tab and getting 10 lines of code is, is something that actually makes change in terms of how much time you need to spend to code. So for me, that was, uh, that was the game changer. And I think it's an evolution of the approach, like you know when we've had languages like C and we had to manage the memory ourselves, and then Java came out and the, the work of the developers become more abstract, more high level. So in here, I guess it's similar. You still need a person who kind of understands what's going on in the code, who can kind of design the code, but that person does not need to write so many lines of code, so it's like more abstract way of working with the code. So. The uh, copilot slogan is don't fly solo. I think that it should be doesn't fly solo. It actually needs human to produce code and you know, answering the question in the title of this presentation, I don't think that AI will take our jobs yet. And there are some links. Uh, I've asked organizers if they will share this. If not, then I will share this on my LinkedIn. Uh, the first one is the article I have wrote for Hacker Noon describing this experiment. And in here, there's this uh, video that you can see two and a half hour of me uh, screaming from pain. Uh, the next one is the beta open AI, which you can just use to play with GPT-3 and try how, it, how, how smart it is answering your input. Um, the next one, uh, are there any designers out there and you think that you are safe because developers are doomed and you're not? This is the video from the guy who took another AI and created a web design based on that. And the idea there is the same. Like, it, he, he was able to create it much faster, but still he was making all the decisions regarding how it should be layout, etc. AI generated a lot of things for him but he was the, the brain of the operation. The next one is for people from marketing and copywriters, because I've also tried to use GPT-3 to write my posts on LinkedIn. I was on vacation, five days with my family, and I've decided, okay, I'm not writing anything. AI will do it for me. Again, uh, you, you would see the results. It's not that engaging as the post that I wrote myself. So, um, the... YouTube one on the bottom is from my YouTube channel. I'm trying to teach how to solve CTF challenges, basically, uh, basically a hacker competitions. 
And this is an episode how to write exploits to software vulnerabilities using just GitHub Copilot without writing any code, which is particularly useful for people from security because they kind of can't code. Or I don't, it's just my opinion. <laughs> And the last one is regarding some controversies around the subject, because if you would like to use Copilot in production projects, you need to understand that there are some controversies regarding copyrights. And if in your code, um, there might be a moment when code from someone else will, will, will show up. So you introduce code from someone else, you might break the copyrights. There are different voices and opinions on that, but it's, it's important to kind of read this and understand. The other thing is about the ethical side of Copilot, because you know a lot of people think it's not cool that they taught this, this model using open source software, and now they're charging people for using it, but they use like free stuff to, to, to teach it. So, it's all to, to kind of read and digest before you decide to use it. And I think I've got three minutes left, so I can take questions. Yep. I can hear you fine. Uh, it's called code. Programming language. It's code. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. So <laughs> the idea is that basically, um, I'm not really thinking that AI will take our jobs uh, at any point uh, unless it replaces us, right? <laughs> so uh, what I mean is uh, we as human beings are actually trying to still um, uh, specify things uh, somehow okay. in, in a strict way and it needs to understand the business context so what yeah the question part the question part okay. uh, because of what's coming so uh do you think that the, the solution um, uh, copilot or anything based on gpt3 uh instead could help us to assist with code i mean uh for instance find the right context uh for a given piece of code for a given uh, snippet search it over github uh, and then give me, okay, you probably want this and this, and watch out on synchronization, for example, at the spreads, something like that. What do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, it works like this. It actually works like this. It is that high level that you just start to try to type uh, the method name or function name, and you have some context around in the code, and it, it kind of understands what will be the imp implementation of that. So it is quite amazing, and it is further uh, in the future that I would expect it to be. Yeah. But regarding the first part, um, I believe it's not really about if you will need to write a specification, but rather who will be responsible for that. Because you probably have some people like, I don't know, product owners or some managers in the project, people that you know uh, take care of the product, and they build specifications. They actually create what they would like to achieve, and they pass it to developers because there's, you know, we are the link that, you know, is at this point is needed to actually code it. So in the future, far, far away, we might not be needed <laughs> that much, or we might need to change, you know, the way we work. That's that's definite because it is like a very big leap from my perspective what it already does in terms of productivity. But there's you know one step more to to actually reduce the need for developers, so it's kind of sad. Uh, yeah, I get it. Uh, I would get a, a bit more detailed in the discussion, but let's have a chat uh, in break. Yeah, okay. cool. Thank you. By the way, we still have uh, some time uh, because uh, I think five more minutes. So if there are if there are questions, feel free to ask them. So if we take the example of um, things like Stable Diffusion or Dolly um, as 
one kind of interesting lesson where machine generated uh, things are interesting. One of the things that I've noticed with these systems is that contrary to what you see on Twitter, people are not putting in prompts and then just getting perfect images out like every single time. Usually you have to spam the regenerate button like 40 or 50 times and then you pick the best one. Yeah. So it's, it's almost more about like, can we find ways of shrinking the iteration cycle, right? Like if you sort of translate this back into code, it's like, can we generate programs, see if it's the right thing? Okay, it's almost the right thing, but like randomly there's a cow standing on the moon, so try regenerating again, try it again. That speaks to iteration cycle. So I almost wonder, and maybe this isn't a question so much as a prompt for free form opinion. It's like maybe the benefit from this sort of like AI arms race is that it will push us to building tooling which allows us to iterate quickly on code and see the results rapidly and be like, no, that's not what I want. And that in C, you would think that would benefit everybody, not just the AI. Okay. I, I, I guess it kind of works like this. You, in Visual Studio, when you install it, you've got these little buttons, next and previous, and you can get next suggestion. It does not work too well. It's the, the suggestions are very similar to each other at this point. But I guess if it will kind of evolve, then it might be like this, that you as developer are picking what you actually would like to achieve and that's that's it, yeah, I guess so. Thanks for that. Any other question? Ooh, more questions. I was not prepared for that. Very simple one question. <laughs> Who will take the blame for the code? Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That, that, yeah, that, okay, that's one thing that developers will always be needed for, to take a blame. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. You okay? Uh, yeah, we still have a minute or two, so last question. Yeah, Ooh. so maybe I have uh, actually a follow-up question, or may I, I saw some, let's say, maybe even confusion uh, in narration, because uh, at one point you said that the, the, the product name is Copilot, so this is the, the, the pilot that uh, usually said on the right seat in the plane or on the left seat in the helicopter, because uh, this is this is uh, the difference usually. Uh, but at some point you mentioned that you decided that uh, the Copilot will be the captain, uh, but in my opinion, actually, you were still, uh, based on your narration, you were always the pilot in command. So I think this is how, how it works. And do okay. you agree, or what is your opinion on that? Okay, may, may, maybe my you know, metaphor is kind of faulty in that case. Uh, yeah, it's more like limo driver and the guy on the back who says to limo driver where, where to go. And, but still, uh, the idea coming from GitHub is to, to actually be a co-pilot and not do all the job by himself, but rather do this job as, as, as a, they, they advertise it as a personal pair programmer thing, so. <laughs> yeah, like, I guess but that's like in aviation, if we have this analogy still, like of course the, all analogies have some limits, but uh, in aviation you have, you have like the, the, the co-pilot that can like uh, operate, like uh, the even start takeoff and uh, maintain the, the cruise uh, altitude and everything, but there is still the captain, the, 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 the pilot, actually the proper name is uh, pilot in command, okay. and he, can, he doesn't have to actually uh, have the con control of the, of the use all, all the instruments, but he's responsible for the. Uh, for he will be. He will take the blame. It, what I can do is just thank for that input. I mean, my knowledge about aviation is that I can sit in the uh, plane sometime and you know fly for my vacation. So <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> I'm not that detailed about these metaphors, and I. I took this metaphor just because of the names of this product. So, <laughs> but that's a good one. Any other question? Uh, lots of questions, good. Uh, I have a question about your experience while working with Copilot. Uh, while you were creating more and more code with it, did you have an experience of that Copilot actually understood you more the more input you provided to it, or it was just the same level all the time? Yep. Uh, it's like when you have a project that's already existing, uh, you can get uh, far better results because it kind of understands how you solve specific problems and it kind of copies the same thought in you know, solving next problem. So if you have, 
I don't know, five controllers in your web application and you will, would like to create another controller, it will know how you basically write the code and it will kind of inherit your style. So this was the hardest kind of way to try it because building something from scratch means that it needs to, it has no guidance in terms of what will be the coding style, etc. Actually, if you I was thinking rather of your input, not the code base you presented to it, but your direct input. So, for example, if you tried to say something like five times with different results, so, for example, if does the copilot works better than ne in the next situation that uh, you presented it with similar... Y it is. You, you saw this one with the enemy. I'm pretty sure that it took the idea that it needs to move because it analyzed the rest of the code that I did. So I still put you know human like input that it just need to create an enemy and it figured out that the enemy should go from the top of the screen to the bottom because that's part of the game logic. And I think it's just because it saw how the spaceship works etc and kind of combined this knowledge to to figuring out what kind of game I'm building. But still it was analyze of your of the created code base, what you have written to the, together, not the things you said to it in the meantime. Yeah, it's, it's like every project works like this. You create some code and you get the, to the next stage. And as as normal developer, you do the same. Like you look into the code you previously did and you just create another code that's similar to it in terms of style, etc. Uh, I, I don't think that I would be able to create it's, it's not working like this that I can, you know, write description in multiple files and then ask it to do all the things on in one time. It's always, you know, something that's uh, auto-completing my code with the tab button. So I, I think it's not not fully possible. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So uh, we are we were ahead of time. Now we are more or less on time. Great. So. Uh, uh, before we get another uh, speaker, maybe uh, last question. I saw a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, on Twitter and social media, the samples when you have uh, some like tools, like for instance, GitHub Copilot, and it was the other tool recently I saw that help you edit videos, for instance, you said, do the blur image or do the, you know, uh, you know, zoom in, zoom out. It was pretty cool, but it, it looked like it's, it's a lot, like it's the other example, it's a little bit of an extended like uh, Hello World or something like that. In terms, in a, in a way like, it doesn't seem like today you could, be use, you could be using it on daily basis at your professional work, right? Is it, okay. is it correct? Not really. With Copilot, I, I've installed it and I'm using it in projects. Oh, awesome. It actually okay. works. It, it, it creates a lot of calls and, you know, it's, it's actually uh, that good. So it's not like just simple example works. Like, it, it actually shows up to be amazing when you have a lot of, lot of code and you can analyze it and, you know, utilize it. Marvelous. All right. So uh, thank you and uh, let's give the round of applause for Wukash. Thank you very much.